Um, thank God they have this remote mic, so I don't have to use this metal thing. Um, my name is Grex. Uh, I run a website, Nova Infosec Portal, with a few folks here that help out, Nathy, Judy, and there's some other discussion going on. Okay, this is what Fire Talks is. I mean, normally people get 45 minutes to an hour to talk, and so the idea of Fire Talks is to, you know, force the speakers to cut out all the fluff and get straight to the point, and, and that simply uh, is what Fire Talks is. Um, I just want to thank, we have some awesome sponsors with some great prizes. We have three judges. Uh, who's the judge? John. Where's John? Dakahuna. He left? Okay. <laughs> All right. The, 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 the judges suck. Anyway. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. There, there we go. He's like right in front of me. All right. All right. So we have John. We have Soap Turtle and Road Clown. Okay. Thank you for judges. So what they're going to do is they're going to look at each of the talks and they're going to rate the talks from 1 to 10. And at the end of two nights, we're going to add them up. And whoever the winner is gets, and Jack, you have to kind of jump up and down with this. This is my Vanna White, isn't it? <laughs> no, wonder he, no wonder he got, like, sexiest infosec guy. So, and guess what? And there's one more thing. It's an iPod to control. And that, as well as some swag, is brought to you by Milton Security Group. So I just want to give a big thanks for them. All right. Then we have a trio of smaller companies. Uh, there's the, Le the Leverage Group, um, Lars, and uh, the Dirty Sec, yes. All right. Anyway, so once again, for second place, I don't know, I think the last year we had a netbook as first place, but guess what? We got something more awesome, and so now the netbook is second place, and it's being used by my friend Judy here. I want to hold it up. She's taking notes on it because she forgot to bring her computer, so. <laughs> Third place is finally brought to you by one of my favorite blogs, Liquid Matrix Security Digest. And once again, you get an iPad. <laughs> you wish. An iPod touch. <laughs> um, so I've put in a little bit of work here, but there's been a lot of folks that have made it a lot easier over the past month. And so I just want to give a big shout out to all of them. We have Jack, Jack Daniel, standing to my right. Uh, he helped with sponsorship the reviewing all the submissions as well as the, the uh, he's helping out with the time this e evening. We have Sarah Clark who is a new contributor to Nova InfoSec Portal. Raise your hand. She's back there. Um, she's going to be doing, she's kind of like the newsy person. She, she's she's going to be tweeting and blogging and stuff so we'll get this out there. Uh, she also helped with review all the paper submissions. We have Jason Oliver who is not here tonight because he sucks. No, I actually, he he just got in late from a business trip. But anyway, he also helped review some of the papers. We have Dukahuna, who is the judge, and and unfortunately, I didn't know this, but Mubix is getting credit for being a judge too. And uh, it looks like I got to add a few more names there too. <laughs> Um, and then Georgia and Adrian, who are both doing the streaming and recording of the Fire Talks. Thank you. Uh, is Boris here? All right. All right. Well, okay. Security. Um, thank you. <laughs> anyway, we we got a few people working security. We have Nathy. We also have Casey. Casey Dunham. So um, there may be a few people that I missed there because in the commotion of the last minute, things have kind of got switched. So tomorrow night it'll be much better. Um, this is the schedule for this evening. Myself, uh, David Zendian, is he here? 
know, so we're going to swap him out with one of the alternate talks, which is going to be Thomas Hallficker, and he's going to be talking about inside your cabinet, a simple alarm using, or excuse me, exploiting PKI for pen testers. Uh, and then next we're going to have Chris John Riley talking about uh, SAP. Uh, Pedro is going to be talking about uh, Router Pwn, a cool, a, cool, a cool little tool that he wrote. We have Michelle who's going to be giving us a very interesting, uh, she's, she's, she's going to be stretching our minds some, let's put it that way. Uh, and then we have Mr. Perez98 who uh, is going to be talking about five ways that we're killing our own privacy. So um, that's all I have. And without further ado, we're going to start up with the first talk. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Do you want me to wait or just continue? Uh, all right. So uh, my name is Thomas Hoffiger, and I gave a very similar talk. It was an hour long at DerbyCon and at ShamuCon, so I uh, shortened it up for uh, the fire talks here. So again, disclaimer, I'm only speaking for myself. I provided, uh, I've left the government service now, but, you know, there may still be some lingering things there. Um, I'll mention that a little bit later. And I found some really good public documentation on the SipperNet smart card. So there's a hint on what to Google for. And it's like the first four hits uh, give you PDFs that talk about it. So this is basically the history of my bio. Um, if you're really interested in reading all that, just watch the uh, video and then pause that slide. So we got the buyer and the disclaimer uh, out of the way. Uh, ne the next, we'll talk about some recon what you can find out there, and then we'll give you some real world examples, some screenshots. Um, for the DerbyCon talk, I had like 150 slides. Um, so the normal recon that you do as part of any pen test, um, a lot of that information is gonna be used um, for your mapping of the PKI infrastructure. What you wanna look for is you wanna look for intranet websites, you wanna look for stuff like employee portals, um, timekeeping systems and OWA is probably one of the most popular one. So you look at those SSL certificates, get the CRL, the certificate revocation download site, and then you can, uh, you know, get the supported uh, protocols from that. Usually it's LDAP or HTTP. You can take the CRLs and then basically convert them to a human readable format. Um, in my other presentation, there's a slide in there what uh, basically the command line that SANS uh, Storm Center used for the, um, when the uh, uh, Komodo, I think it was, when their uh, certificates got compromised. So um, you gotta find the ways to obtain the public PKI certificates, obviously the public websites. Uh, those certificates would be easy to find. Um, again, look for those that are on their internal network. And then what you'll wanna look for is look at the common names. The common names in the certificates most likely will match DNS um, they should, and then a lot of times you'll find PKI certificates where you'll see the common name and it doesn't resolve in DNS. So what you started to do there is look at their internal uh, PKI infrastructure and their DNS infrastructure may be split, but that doesn't necessarily mean that their uh, PKI infrastructure is split in the same way. And of course, most of the internal PKI in infrastructure for most organizations is going to be Microsoft Active Directory. So you'll also want to do the same thing for um, looking for email public certificates. You can find those in Google. Um, some of the public mailing list archives are also good places to look. They don't strip those off. Um, another great place to look for, and a good practical example of this, is the HB Gary compromised by Anonymous. The email spool for that had lots of people um, that had sent signed emails to their support organization wanting to get new license keys. Um, even though HP Gary didn't have a capability for doing encrypted email, they signed those emails anyway, so they have basically put their uh, public certificate out there. So the people that send those emails are probably not gonna be your average Joe user in those organizations. They're gonna be people that are instant responders, guys that do computer forensics. 
So um, if you've been watching the whole Bradley Manning uh, hearing up in Fort uh, Meade, there's people from what's called Army CCI, the Computer Crimes Investigation uh, Unit, and I've actually gone through the HP Gary, and I've seen lots of people um, that are connected, let's say, with the DOD in the uh, cybercrime uh, field. Um, and it's like, yep, know that guy, know that guy, know that guy. So if you're going to utilize that uh, signature, you can also um, send them an email that you know because you're going to encrypt it with their, with their public key, which they can only read because they have the private key. So the problem with that is, is you also need to have a PKI certificate that you can encrypt email, which is not a problem because you can get one of those for free. Um, the URL there is, is va uh, valid and you can also revoke the certificate. The certificate itself is valid for an entire year. Um, I show in the full talk where you can basically send an email to uh, another address and uh, you know it opens, it looks legitimate. Um, if you want to further uh, basically sign the email with a certificate that doesn't match the actual email address, there's a way you could do that in Gmail uh, with an add-on. It doesn't work in Outlook, uh, unfortunately. So why would you want to encrypt that phishing email? Well, the reason's fairly simple. Um, you bypass the email scanning that happens on the server uh, because that's encrypted, so they can look at the header, they can look at the, you know, the subject of the email, but not the body. In addition, um, the only way that an email anti-spam gateway uh, antivirus could look at that email and decrypt it is if they had a recovery key. So for an organization, you would have to have a, a, like almost a master type recovery key so you can decrypt all that. And there's probably not a high likelihood that an organization would trust somebody with like a master key, the keys to the kingdom, to put on a, a box to basically decrypt everyone's email that's coming in. So also looking, if you're looking uh, for the actual PKI infrastructure or sites that describe their infrastructure, um, you Google for terms like PKI, CRL, or OCSP. Um, you use the Google uh, operators to uh, minimize your results that you get back. Um, one of the interesting operators is the site operator. Uh, and uh, you know, I had found some sites where you know, they put all their stuff on pki.foo.com. And it's like, you know, it'd be great if I could use a wildcard to search in there. And uh, you know, because I don't want to you know, go through all the domains or all, let's say, the top level domains that I know. So the good news is it does work. So you can actually go out there and put wildcards in the Google site operator. I actually looked at the Google um, help, and they didn't actually say that the wildcards were uh, valid for use. And when I started doing these, I had my first experience of Google thinking I was a bot, and I had to do, uh, fill out the CAPTCHA. Um, also works, you can, uh, you know, and stuff together with the regular type of uh, regex uh, expressions. Uh, so this is the result if you uh, basically search out for uh, com. Um, the actual interesting thing here, circled in red, you have the, um, you know, Google response back there, you know, advertisement. And, uh, you know, they have in there the wildcard and if you own that domain. Um, I that this is probably not a function that's intended to be there, or maybe not even known, and, or their routine for the ads doesn't compensate for that. And um, the actual first hit is a false positive because it's a website that uh, produces software for PKI. But as you can see there, you go down, you've got uh, you know, PKI certificates for Honeywell employees, uh, some banks, um, and uh, you know, ING corporate you know, certificates. If you do it for .gov, you start out with people like the Nuclatory, uh, a Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, the Treasury Department, uh, and actually the Treasury Department provides services, uh, outsource services for other government organizations. Uh, you know, for instance, they also provide services to some parts of the Department of Justice. So a good project if you're wanting to look um, for PKI-enabled infrastructure or private CAs is the EFSS SSL Observatory Project. They actually went out and literally scanned the entire internet on TCP 443, wound up reading the certificates and did a whole bunch of filtering on them, and this is the stats that they came back with. Um, so real-world examples, anybody here work for SAIC by chance? 
Okay, nobody's willing to admit it. So this is where SCIC falls in the uh, you know, uh, EFF observatory. And so I found this actual website here where they publish the CRLs. And the issue that you have here is you have both public and private, in other words, internal SSL certificate revocation list published. So circled in red there, you can see that it's actually using a Microsoft certificate authority. So uh, you know for sure that that uh, box that issued that certificate is uh, you know, a Microsoft box. And here you can see that it's actually a, a sub-CA. Um, again, here, down here you, in the bottom, you'll see that it is the, uh, you know, the URL to get to the actual uh, CRLs. And there's, uh, using uh, Netcraft, there is the actual um, you know, web server and the software and the OS that it runs. The other example uh, is DISA. So if you Google DOD PKI certificate, you get the first hit. And it's the actual uh, site that you go to to request, uh, you know, a signed uh, certificate based upon the, uh, you know, the one that you just created. Um, you'll note that the bottom of this page says the site is unclassified for official use only. Uh, after my talk at DerbyCon, there was uh, a couple of people that said, "Hey, this is FOU, and uh, you know uh, you shouldn't have disclosed this," and uh, tried to give me a whole bunch of trouble on it. And I made the argument, "Hey, it's open to the world. It's open to the internet. Anyone can get there." So if you go to the website, this is what you'll wind up seeing. You get a little disclaimer that pops up. So you wind up using the retrieval tab and then you search for certificates and you can basically fill out any of those values. So the one that probably is going to be the most useful is the one that says common name. That's where you put the fully qualified uh, domain name. So here's the result if you put in www.cybercom.mil, you'll get the actual certificate values back. If you search for something like VPN, the only problem with this portal interface is you're limited to 99 uh, results. So you can see here the first one is common name vpntest.nos.aet.ds.af.mil. Um, probably a pretty good box to target because they call it VPN test. Um, here's another one. If you search based upon organizational unit for NSA, you come back with a couple of hits. This one, first one here happens to be a revoked certificate. There's all kinds of options in here that you can search for when the certificate was issued, when it expires. So um, if you look at it from a vid uh, validity perspective, you could possibly use this because we know all the users normally click yes when a certificate is expired so you can possibly um, get someone to connect to a website that doesn't have a valid certificate. So other queries that I've run in the, in the time uh, between uh, DerbyCon and HackerCon are you looking for Active Directory and um, also you get local host results. Uh, possibilities are endless and that pretty much concludes it. Uh, I need somebody to give me $370,000 so I can register a couple TLDs. You'll notice the O is not an O, it's actually a zero and the L is a one. Again, my presentation from DerbyCon and HackerCon is out there. Uh, I don't know what it runs. I just saw that it was an absorbent amount of money. I think it's like 185 to do the initial registration. Oh, Lord. Well, I don't have that kind of money, and I doubt they will let me register it anyway. <laughs> so, any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. All right, so next up, we're going to have Chris Joan Riley. So one of the things, is this even working? Hello. OK. So one of the things I tried to do was I asked each of the speakers to give me their boxing intro. So this is Chris's. He's a three, maybe I, just, maybe, maybe I should do it here for effect. All right. The three-time world, Tweety Lynx. Twiddle, <laughs> Twiddle Wings champion and all-around media whore, 
now hailing from the middle of the middle of nowhere, Austria. He's just this guy you know. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chris John Riley. Back up, man. Okay. Is he not going to come back up? All right. Just well, being someone with it. Theoretically, you were supposed to have a speaker throw this, but you know. All right. I'll, I'll just okay. do this. There you go. Well done. You almost got someone. Well done. Are we good to go? Go. So, are we good? All right, if I knew the camera was going to be down there, I would have plucked my nose hair. So, sorry for the people watching on the feed. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about SAP. Um, but before we do, a little bit about me. I do blogging, podcasting, general media whore, stuff like that. So, um, <laughs> I'm meant to be representing Dirty Sec today, but it's so cold I had to put a jumper on, so I'm sorry. No dirty sack t-shirt. Um, I'm a firm believer in uh, the saying that the, the wisest man is he who knows that he knows nothing. So um, I'm not an expert in any way, shape, or means. Especially not about SAP. Um, which is the reason why I'm not doing a full talk and I'm only doing a, a, a fire talk. Um, I'm also not a CISSB. And, yeah, yeah. And, and I'm not a manager. Um, um, but I do test pens, so um, I like testing pens. My favorite pen, it's a, it's a kind of a thick marker pen, but it's another story. So, so what are we going to talk about today? Are we going to talk a little bit about SAP? Are we going to cover the basics, um, what SAP is really quickly, um, a little bit about information is king and how we can get information out of SAP boxes, and then a little bit about stopping Bob. So what's what? SAP. Who's ever heard of SAP? No one, right, okay. Um, so, I mean, everyone has their information in 
at least one SAP system somewhere. Okay, if you don't think you have, then you're wrong. Sorry. Um, SAP pretty much runs the world. Yeah. Uh, SAP is at the heart of most large organizations. So somewhere along the line, your information goes into an SAP box and is archived for life, which is kind of depressing. Um, when I started working with SAP stuff, I still had hair. <laughs> okay, this, this, this is depressing. But I mean, SAP described themselves as this, this big company that holds all of your information. And, and they're right, they're the big company that hold all your information. They're a huge company, 120,000 clients worldwide. Um, most people who really know about the security of SAP describe them as the biggest repository of information that everyone wants to get. Because why bother scraping information from a thousand sources if you can just hack the SAP box and download it all to your system? So SAP boxes on pen tests are great, but it's pretty bad. It's scary. Is it really that bad? Fuck yes, it's that bad. Um, uh, 2010, um, SAP released at one time 500 security patches. Not bug fixes, actual security patches. 500 at once. Um, I don't have a slide that says this, that they released 900 security patches at the end of 2011 because I couldn't find anyone who covered it in the press. You mean they're really secure yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's the thought. I mean, maybe they're secure because they're releasing all these patches. Of course, that's complete bollocks. But yeah. So, um, why are they so insecure? It's because there's a thousand buttons and knobs that you can twiddle and you can set to one or two or three or five, and you pay a uh, SAP consultant hundreds of thousands a year to twiddle the knobs and then disappear, and every time it breaks, yeah. So it's, it's pretty bad. Um, vulnerabilities are part of it, but most of it's due to configuration issues. Even people at SAP, hi SAP, um, aren't really 100% sure on how to secure their own systems. So there's always going to be vulnerabilities in SAP systems. So the other problem you come across is that there, there's always a project manager who's like, you can't test that. That's productive. That's got all of our valuable information. You can't test it. Fucking moron. Um, <laughs> yeah, because you only test systems that are not important. You only test systems that, you know, that are not critical. So um, to rush through this bit, we're going to talk about SAP. SAP is huge. We're only interested in this little red bit at the bottom that you probably can't see in this projector because it's really bad. Um, SAP NetWeaver, okay, it's huge. It's the big blue thing on the screen. Um, we're going to be talking specifically about SOAP. And we're going to be talking specifically about security of SOAP in this small dot somewhere there. So SAP is a huge topic, okay? To give you a little idea of how um, normal people interact with SAP Management Console. Um, there's an MMC snap-in. That's convenient. You probably saw it flicking around on the screen. I was trying to get it working. Um, they also have a Java applet. Um, well, it uh, seems to have expired at some point, about three years ago. But yeah, there is, an, there is a Java applet, and I'm sure that's ripe for man in the middling if I could actually be bored to write a script to do it. But um, we're going to be, we're not going to be using these interfaces because that's boring, but we're going to be using SOAP, okay? Simple object access protocol. It's not that kind of SOAP. Yeah, you wish, okay? That's in the other room. Um, it's, <laughs> are we true? No, no, you can't leave. <laughs> not from that direction, you can't. Um, yeah, so, um, so anyone who hasn't seen a SOAP request, it's, it's a simple XML format. You send it in a post request. The important stuff is the envelope, okay? So you've got your envelope, you've got all your headers, then you send your interesting stuff. You say what you want. I want the stock price for SAP, which is probably plummeting at this very moment. Um, you then get a response. You get the stock price, 34.5 pesos, probably. Um, simple as that, okay? M most people are moving to REST interfaces, but SAP are keeping it real. They're still using SOAP. So a little bit about SAP Management Console. Um, it runs on HTTP or HTTPS. Um, I found a, a couple of HTTPS systems. I'm sure they're all, all using self-signed certs. But um, it can use SSL. Most of the time, it doesn't seem to be. Um, but it also uses basic authentication. Um, yeah, it's 2011. Actually, it's 2012. Shit. 
So yeah, it's 2012, um, and people are still using basic authentication. Um, but most of the things I'm going to be talking about here aren't even requiring any authentication at all. So it's also enabled by default on every single SAP system by default. So information is king. Okay, we, we want to get information out of this SAP box. So how are we going to get some information out? Um, let's run a Nessus scan. You know, Nessus is going to help us because Nessus knows everything. So we run a quick Nessus scan on our SAP box, and it tells us that, oh, there's one low finding with no risk at all. So let's prove them wrong, OK? Let's jump into some Metasploit, and let's see whether or not we can prove them wrong. Okay. This is probably going to fail horribly at this point. And it still works. How am I going to type? <laughs> talk, then type, type, then talk. Okay, okay um, we're going to run a simple scan. Wow, it's really bad. Is that better? There you go. Okay, so we're going to run a simple scan. Uh, all we've done in Metasploit here is we've set the, uh, the, the R hosts to a single value. Um, and we're just going to run a simple scan. Okay, so you're seeing a number of ports are open there. Everything that comes up there is open. Um, but the ones we're interested in at the top of the screen, 50013 and 50014, which are the SAP um, start service, which is the SAP management console. So now we know the information of the, the management console. We can jump in a little bit, find out the version. Yeah, these modules are now in trunk. So. Okay, so using the, the same information again, we've set like a global host. We can pull up the, you can use the, the version information, pull up the exact version, including the patch and change sets. So you can tell exactly at the last point they installed any patch on the SAP box at all. So you know exactly what, uh, what version of SAP they're running, so you know what vulnerabilities they've got. You also know um, uh, the interesting information about the SAP SID which should be listed as NSP. There it is, SAP SID NSP. Um, SAP bases usernames and default passwords, when it has default passwords, on the SAP SID name. So this is a really interesting piece of information. So, I mean, there's a lot of modules that I put in here. Basically, all the, they're all using the, the SOAP interface. Um, some of the more interesting things like get M. Get N, which is basically on the Windows system I'm using, going to pretty much output the entire environment variables for the machine itself. So you, you now know that they're using uh, the system name NSP, and as you can see, um, the system name WinXP SAP TST, and if you look um, somewhere along that list, it should also be the username that it's running under. Um, yeah, there it is, username SAP service NSP. Okay, so we know what they're running. We can see from the environment variables whether or not they're running a specific version of Oracle. Um, from the path variables, we can find out some information about their system. But well, we want to go further. We want to go one step further. So we've got the username. Let's try some brute force. You probably can't see any of this due to the font. Yeah, damn those demo gods. 
Okay. Well, that's running a brute force, which is taking a little bit longer than I thought. But three minutes? Wow. Okay. In this case, verbose is bad. <laughs> um, if you filter through here, you'll find that there's a couple of hits. Okay, here's one. That's perfect for us. We've got like a green hit here saying the SAP NSP login, the password to change me with a big C and a big and a three instead of the E. So let's use that to get shell on the system. Yeah, my password's wrong. <laughs> Please let this work. Okay, yeah. Woo! Shell. Um, <laughs> Basically, this breaks up the, uh, the Metasploit payload into a number of small chunks and just shoves them through the SOAP interface until you get a shell. Do I have two seconds or am I done? Two seconds. Two seconds? Um, <laughs> right, uh, yeah. Um, so, in case you forgot, uh, all the functions are unauthenticated, okay? So, but it's okay because you have to be inside the network to get any of this stuff to work. Um, so, very, very quickly, um, I ran a small scan um, of a slide that takes a long while to load because there's too much graphics on it. I ran a small scan of a small country, um, Austria, where I live. Um, and just in Austria alone, I found 2,600 open SAP boxes. Um, so you can only imagine the kind of shit that, that you can get up to with this. So I'll leave it there. There's a full copy of the presentation at Hash Days or Security Zone. They've got the videos up. And if you want the slides, just let me know. I just wanted to, again, you know, thank our awesome sponsors. We have Milton Security. This, like, cool-ass helicopter thing that I wish I got to play with. Uh, we also have the combination of uh, large leverage and uh, dirty sec with the laptop. Judy. And then lastly, the mini, what did we want to call this? The mini iPad, is that it? Okay, sweet. From Liquid Matrix Security, thank you. Pedro actually has a nice little full intro, so. All right, so here we go. 
They say routers killed his parents. A true router hater. The most wanted enemy of the telecom companies in Mexico, Pedro HKM. Well, hi. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Yeah, I'm from uh, a little bit information about me. I'm from uh, Cozumel Island in the Mexican Caribbean. You're all invited there. Tell you later. Um, I love hacking routers. <laughs> And I've uh, been a speaker at many conferences, and recently I founded a web security company with some friends. So Routerpone, you can access it by going to www.routerpone.com. It's a compilation of uh, ready-to-run local and remote web exploits, mostly web exploits. It currently has 138 uh, web exploits, three unique generators, and some exploits are still uh, OD. Uh, it's entirely made in HTML and JavaScript. The idea is to have it uh, run in any kind of device. It can run in most smartphones, even on not so smartphones and old phones, and also on gaming consoles. On the Wii, it's very fun. And um, <laughs> it's only one web page, one simple web page, so you can store it offline for, uh, well, offline exploitation, uh, local exploitation. Uh, and yeah. So this is the interface. It has a cool 8-bit glowing logo. And after that, it has uh, the uh, name of the manufacturers. I added a lot of new manufacturers, also uh, firmware developers, or firmwares. And um, after that, you have the useful tools, like a Mac to vendor lookup, uh, an interface for Shodan, and a default password list. And then the three generators I was telling you about. The first one is the Iris password of the day generator for Iris cable modems. There's like this uh, tech support interface in which you need a, a password that changes every day. But this uh, program got leaked and it's everywhere on the internet. So if you actually want the password of the day, you just click on it and it tells you that that's the password of the day. <laughs> There's also a recent, well, an exploit published like three months ago for, uh, not, not an exploit, a generator for backdoor passwords in Acton based switches. Um, this router point is mostly for hacking home routers and uh, access points and modems, but it also has uh, this generator. And the last one is uh, research we made for Huawei home gateway routers. That's a generator for the default wireless key. And you can see the interface is very similar to that of uh, exploit pages. It has the name of the exploit. Uh, the, difference, the main difference here is if you click on the name of the exploit, instead of taking you to the information about the exploit, it launches the exploit locally to the default IP. If you want to information about the exploit, you just click on the plus sign and it will take you to the, the advisory. Uh, if you click in the model, you can see pictures of the routers. So if you see a router and you don't know which model it is, you actually can click on those and kind of get the idea. If you want to launch the exploit remotely, you can click on the IP link and the pop-up will say what IP do you want to launch the exploit to. So, um, we've made this an app for mobile devices, not for all mobile devices. Um, iPhone users, sorry, I just changed my iPhone to an Android because it's better. And, um, <laughs> So if you want to, let's say, install this in the iPhone, you can just add a simple shortcut to your screen and have the icon there. Uh, but if you have an Android phone, you can download the app from the Android market. It's available again in the Android market because it was taken down, but it's now available, so get it while it's still there. <laughs> um, it, it's useful for offline exploitation in case you don't have internet access, yeah, you can just use it offline. So I brought a few videos here on the usage of the tool. The first one is an authentication bypass for SBG 900 cable modems, Motorola. The default username and password is admin Motorola, but in this case we're gonna try admin and something as a password. It's not really the password, but we'll try it. Press login and it says nothing, it's not the password. So we use router pwn, click on Motorola, and then on the SBG change admin password exploit, uh, paste something, the password we just copied, and it says continue. So let's see if it worked. We put admin as the user ID and just paste in the password we copied. 
and we got in. <laughs> this one's a little bit different. Um, some routers in Mexico, the most popular router in Mexico is the two-wire uh, router. There's an administration interface that runs on port 50001 uh, remotely. So you can see here it asks for a password, but we're going to try a remote denial of service. <laughs> so we copy the, the IP and then just look for two wire. And remember, we, oh, we're going to ping the modem so we, you can see it's alive and responding to pings. So we click on the IP link. So it asks for an IP, just paste in that IP. Click accept. And it has stopped responding to pings. The third one is the Huawei generator I was uh, telling you about. Uh, we did this research and um, we found out the algorithm for generating the default web or WPA keys. So this is the second most popular router in Mexico actually. You can uh, see that it's a Huawei by, um, well, using any wire driving tools. So you can copy the MAC address or just by the MAC address, looking for the vendor. So there we just copy the MAC address and Use router pwns generator, Let's see. Huawei, Mac to WebKey default wireless key. Just paste in the Mac, and it gives us the WebKey. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's, so let's test this WebKey. Let's see if it works. We're going to try to connect. And it seems to have worked. So we're going to try to get into the administration interface of the modem. But the only problem actually is that it's uh, protected. It has uh, a password. So the username is the name of the service provider. And the password is the same web key we just cracked. <laughs> <laughs> and we're in. This is a very simple vulnerability, but it's part of a greater one that I will show you in a moment. It's just a URL that's into wire routers that allows you to, um, it's a configuration disclosure vulnerability. You click on the link and it gives you the configuration. In the configuration, it's an XML in which you can see, I don't know, the DSL username and password in clear text. Also the ESS ID, for example, and also the default web key, the default wireless key in plain text. This is a very bad idea. <laughs> because the way you reset the password in uh, these routers is by using that default web key. So I'm going to show you this um, other um, password reset exploit that uses three vulnerabilities in order to reset the password. I'm going to show you how it works. So first we try to, uh, well, here's how it works. This is the link. If you copy the link, the script is actually contained inside the link. It's a JavaScript that performs um, XHR requests in order to get information from the modem and parse it and everything. Here you can see that the first vulnerability it uses is a, here over here, it's a cross-site scripting in order to get into the same zone as the router. After that, uh, it parses the same page we you just looked at, the configuration disclosure page. It looks for the web key. And once it has the web key, it uses that web key in, it, in the form to reset the password. So um, this is how it looks. Uh, we're going to try to enter the advanced configuration interface of the modem. It asks for a password. We don't know the password, so we're going to just try auth bypass as a password. So we copy that. And of course, it says the password is incorrect. So this is how it looks when you uh, launch the exploit from the router pwn. Just click on the link, and it asks for a new password. Paste in the auth bypass. Let it do its thing. Its thing. And after that, it says done. So let's try it. Let's see if it worked. 
we're going to try to access the same advanced configuration interface and just paste in that password. Click OK. And we're in. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Uh, there's still a few functions I'm uh, working on, like uh, adding more exploits. I'm always looking for more exploits. I have to scrape the lists and ask people for them. And recently, um, many persons have sent me their exploits, even exploits that are not available online, some that they have been keeping. You can only find them in this tool, so it's really good. Some content and some savvy exploits for strange German and other routers. Uh, I wanted also to check for uh, exploitation before actually exploiting the router. <laughs> uh, firmware version detection also, and to port more tools and generators. So you can use the contact form, that's uh, routerpwn.com slash contact, in order to send me your stuff or your contributions. Regarding the device detection, um, I have been working on something. I try to do this detection by using uh, images that are um, stored in the local administrator interface of the modems. Um, here, I have some videos. For example, this is the detection of a two-wire. If you can try, you want to try to just put slash detect.html. It's not linked uh, from the main page, but uh, it's in beta. You can see it's really quick. It says manufacturer, model, and the IP. It works for about, uh, I think I have like 10 different signatures. Uh, if it doesn't detect your modem, it actually shows you a form so you can submit your, your path, your image path. It works for Thomson also, speed touch. And the last video I will show you, I forgot about it. It's a recent uh, zero day for Huawei routers that uh, a friend sent me. This is the most recent addition to the tool. Uh, it's a remote. <laughs> It's a remote um, PPP or DSL uh, password disclosure for Huawei routers. As you can see, these routers, at least in Mexico, are very badly configured. This is a scan of one single subnetwork, I mean, one single uh, network. And most of them are these routers that have their uh, administration interface listening publicly on the internet. So we're going to just uh, try a random IP from those. and just uh, look for Huawei. There's a remote PPP, we click on the IP, put the IP, click accept, it says continue, and that's the password in clear text for DSL connection. <laughs> And well, yeah, that has been all. Thank you so much for accepting the talk, and I hope you like it, and I hope you contribute also. And uh, that's it. Thanks. Well, before I leave, I actually told you uh, you were all in. Get hooked up here. Just a little bit about Michelle. Like I said, she's also known as Mrs. Y. She's a senior network security engineer with 15 years of IT experience. In her free time, she blogs and contributes to podcasts on the subject of IT security for packet pushers, which you can find at packetpushers.net plug. She also likes long walks, long, <laughs> long walks in hub sites, traveling to security conferences, and spending extended hours in the bat cave. Sincerely believes that every problem can be solved with a for loop. Ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Y. Okay, this is going to be a little bit different than probably what most of you are used to. Um, it's not very technical. It's uh, focused mostly on neuroscience. I am, as he said, I'm a senior network security engineer. I work for a financial services provider right now. Um, I contribute to packet pushers. I am not a neuroscientist. Sorry. The problem, we spend thousands, millions, and millions of dollars on tools. Vendors love to sell us tools, DLP, firewalls, IDS, IPS, you name it, management likes to buy it. 
And what happens? The weakest link is the user. So even with training, and we spend lots of training on, for users, they still make the wrong choices. They still click the boxes they're not supposed to click. They're st they still open documents they're not supposed to open. They go to Facebook, Twitter, they post in confidential information, they use their pet's name as a password. But what if this isn't about users being stupid? We like to believe that, but what if the problem is really us? What if it's the way that we work with the user in trying to make these changes happen? Really? Okay. I talk really loud. Um, okay, here's a little bit of brain science. I tried to simplify it a lot, so I'm not going to go into a significant detail. But um, you've got three sections. If you make a fist right now with your hand, this is actually a good model of the brain. So this is your spinal cord, your brain stem. Right here, your thumb could be considered your limbic system, which is the emotional center. Um, and then your fingers can be considered the, the cortex. Right here, you can consider that the prefrontal cortex, which is the management center of the brain. The way that you process, for example, a threat response, your cortex is going to take in data, input of some kind, either externally or even internally through your own brain simulation. Now what's going to happen is your emotional center, your limbic system, and your prefrontal cortex are going to take this information in at the same time. But your limbic system is fast. That's from evolution. It's determining threat right away. Oh, is that a tiger? I've got to run. But the prefrontal cortex is the tortoise. Nah, I'm going to take my time. I've got to figure out what's really going on here. It's got to do the analysis. But the limbic system's already done. The amygdala, which is the key component of the limbic system is sort of like the alarm. And it's deciding right then and there within a few seconds, do I need to set off a stress response? Now the reason I'm telling you all this is because A, one of the most important things that you have to understand is the limbic system is an open loop. It's highly influenced because we are social beings your limbic system, my limbic system, are influenced by other people in, in propinquity to you. So, for example, have you ever noticed that when somebody's in a bad mood and comes to work, that you don't want to be around them? It's because they're going to make you feel bad. Or if somebody's happy and they're around you, you want to be around them. That's because of this limbic system open loop. The brain, because the limbic system is, is faster than the prefrontal cortex, has a negativity bias. Traumatic experiences are stickier than happy experiences. And why this is important is that you're going to be in situations where you're not going to realize that you set off a threat response in somebody else, or they're under the effect of a threat response. For example, in a meeting, traffic was bad. You're working with users. You have an assessment. They're pissed off because they've been in traffic and their threat response is up. And you're trying to talk to them and you're asking for their help. And what are they going to say? You're perceived as additional threat. So they're going to be resistant to you. And that's what you're probably noticing a lot of times. It's not just the information that you present, but how you present it to them. So some of the common things that, that will help you recognize an amygdala hijack in yourself, for example, is have you ever noticed out of the corner of your eye, you look and you think it's a threat and you know it's a shadow or something, and you think maybe it's somebody coming to attack you and it's just, it, it was just imagination. You know, one of the common things is you see a stick on the ground and you thought it was a snake in the grass, but it, it was just a stick. But your prefrontal cortex has to figure that out about a minute, two minutes later after your limbic system. One common example of uh, this kind of quick response by the limbic system is called thin slicing. Um, 
Warren Harding, for example, commonly recognized as one of the most mediocre and worst presidents the United States has ever had. But he was good looking, he was personable, he was tall, he was, you know, everybody thought, wow, I really like him. So they voted for him. And they got a, work, a really bad president. The way we present information is going to decide how we are accepted within an organization, whether our changes are accepted, and whether we are going to be perceived with affinity or as threat. So when you go to your next meeting or when you present your next assessment, I'd like all of you to consider, for example, you know, you're a tire. <laughs> you know, um, I think your haircut's really cool, for example. I like the mohawk <laughs> that's going on there. But if you walk into Bank of America, you know, and they're all wearing suits and ties, you know, they're going to, human nature is that we're very tribal, we're looking for affinity, and they're going to think, ooh, he's not like me, threat, threat. And so when you present your assessment, I mean, no offense, they're going to say, yeah, I don't know, he doesn't look like us, I don't know who that guy is. I mean, that's just the way the human brain works. So what does work? If we know that training has failed with users, and we know that there's this open loop, we know that uh, people make intuition and, and, and gut decisions based on very little information, one thing that has been shown to work is the dynamic feedback loop. Um, in the 60s, they discovered that uh, giving individuals a clear goal and a method of evaluating progress increased the likelihood that they would achieve it. And I know that doesn't really mean anything, but think about, you know, those digital speeding signs? In California, they did a study, and these signs were shown to be more effective than actually writing tickets. Why? Because you're going down the street, you see a sign that says the speed limit is 25 miles per hour. Then you see, oh, I'm doing 34. Well, everybody else can see me doing 34 miles per hour too. Oh, God, and it's a school zone, that's embarrassing. That's why it works. And they've shown that it's effective and has reduced on speeds on the average of 10%. And sometimes they saw that people were going even slower than the advertised speed limit. So what if we could use something like this in security training? If we could give dynamic feedback to a user without fear of punishment and just giving them an idea of how effective they were, you know, or what decisions they were making and how dangerous those decisions were. What else works? Social and emotional intelligence. The key competencies of these skills uh, empathy, self-awareness, self-regulation, conflict management, collaboration, leadership, these are highly effective tools. If you guys are only going to, to technical courses and you're not taking communications classes, if you're not including that in your professional development, I encourage you. This will be very helpful to you in overcoming resistance. So, I'd like all of you to think now about when, when you go to your next meeting, when you have your next interaction with somebody who's not in your team, I'd like you to notice how you may be inciting a threat response in them, how you may be encountering resistance to change, which in fact is just them going through threat response. Can you notice an amygdala hijack in yourself? You're in traffic, you're waiting in line, and you're getting frustrated. Um, you know, you had an argument with your partner. I mean, you're in threat response, and then you yell at somebody else. So I'd like to thank, I, I did vet this with um, you know, a psychologist and a PhD in uh, neuroscience. And I also use books by, and I encourage you to, to use these books by Dan Siegel, Dan Goleman, and Rick Hansen. Um, I'm a member of uh, Packet Pushers. You can find us on the web. Um, 
I encourage you to uh, also, if you'd like to blog and you haven't blogged before, I encourage you to apply to Packet Pushers and become a blogger. We'd love to have you. Thank you. Does any, anybody have any questions? I went too fast. Yes. Um, wow, that, uh, you know, this was, I, this was a really short period of time to talk, go into detail about emotional intelligence and uh, the core competencies. Um, if you're in management, I encourage you to bring somebody in like a leadership coach or a communications expert. I can certainly recommend them offline. We can have a drink or coffee and I can do that. I can also recommend some books that uh, would enable you to um, help that person understand, um, to have some awareness about how their behavior impacts others. I mean. I have to tell you that my uh, past is not, I spend a lot of time with emotional and social intelligence out of necessity because I was very bad at it. I was emotionally tone deaf for most of my life and I, I had to learn the hard way. So um, I can certainly make recommendations to anybody who would like that or uh, respectful confrontation methods or nonviolent communication or um, also uh, The Mind to Lead by Suzanne Kreider, she's great. So. <laughs> I'm sorry? It, it's actually a, a Marshall Rosenberg. He's been sent to Rwanda and to Israel to negotiate and mediate with people. It's a, it's a recognized technique. It's excellent. I can highly recommend. There are nonviolent communication groups all over the city of, of all over the metro area and the DC area. Thank you. All right. Just wanted to make one announcement. <laughs> he basically came, came up with the he needs no introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mike, the Prez 98. Good evening. Uh, my name is Michael Shear, the Prez 98. I'm going to talk about five ways that we're killing our own privacy. This is sort of an extension of my DEF CON talk where I talked about how the government's destroying our privacy. Um, and uh, so this is my background. Uh, last year, I quit working for the man and started working for myself. Um, spent eight years in the Navy. Uh, I was a founding member of, of a Church of Wi-Fi in an unallocated space and a father of four. And a husband of seven years to my beautiful wife. Uh, last year I started a blog called The Assault on Privacy, which documents uh, uh, government assaults on privacy. And, um, but I don't update the blog anymore so, because I was just posting links to articles. So I just started a Twitter feed. So AOP blog, AOP blog, just follow it. Um, it basically posts links to Fourth Amendment issues, right to privacy issues, etc. Why you should be skeptical. So a lot of people get up here and tell you why, they, why you should listen to them. And I'm going to tell you why you shouldn't listen to me. Well, because number one, I'm not a lawyer. I'm going to talk about laws, but I'm not a lawyer. Although maybe lawyers should tell you that you shouldn't listen to them. Um, because you see a lot of 5-4 Supreme Court cases, right? So intelligent people can disagree on what the law really means. Um, my presentation is, is, is influenced by what I believe. So um, there's going to be biases in it. So, I, some of them I'm aware of and some of them I'm not, so it's your responsibility to figure that out. It's not a political presentation, but we're talking about politics here, so it, we're we'll getting into that a little bit. Don't take my word for it. Go out there and find it and figure out it on yourself. Okay, before I start, I'm, before I start talking about why we're responsible, I'm going to talk about a decision that came down. I'm going to talk really fast because I got way too many slides. Talk about a decision that came down at the Supreme Court on Monday in the case of the United States versus Jones. Uh, it was a 9 to 0 decision, which is awesome. Um, the, basically said, the government basically said that the attachment of a GPS device to monitor someone's movements constituted a search, which is really good, which means the Fourth Amendment applies. This is where I say you shouldn't take for granted what people say. 
If you read the newspaper, it said the, they said that the court said that you need a warrant. The decision did not say that you needed a warrant. The decision said you needed a search, which is an important distinction. Um, you can read the quote up there from uh, Justice Sotomayor. She talked about the third party. This is probably the most important Fourth Amendment decision related to technology in decades, so really you should go read it. That's all. <laughs> These are the five ways that we're responsible for our own privacy uh, being destroyed. Ignorance, there's two types of ignorance. One is intentional. This is the I don't care, I don't really care about that, um, I don't know, I don't care, I don't care to know. The second is intentional or is innocent ignorance. This is something that you just didn't realize. It's not your fault. You just you were under, you you didn't know about it. Number two, we're consumers, right? 18 million people follow like celebrities on Twitter because they want to know what they're doing. We 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 hunger for data for for information about people. So so somebody goes and gets it for us. We're social animals. We have desire to share information with people. Um, it's convenient. We can make things better, cheaper, and faster by sharing information. So we do it. And then acquiescence, which I'll talk about last, and that's the most dangerous. Okay, I'm riding the Mark train uh, here the other day, and people people wear their their passes on their lanyards. And if you if you open the pass, it has a person's name on it in an area like right there. It says passenger name. So this guy's talking on the phone, and I'm only hearing one side of his conversation. But I get the idea from the conversation that he's a minister. So I was like, okay, and I looked at his name. So I was like, okay, we'll see, see what I can find out about this guy in like two minutes on my phone. Well, this was him. The guy's name was Eric Holder, which is, he wasn't the attorney general, but that was his name. And I, I, I Googled him and I found a picture and I was like, that's him. And his whole biography was on the internet and I found that out in two minutes by looking at his past. So think about that. So it's a table, right? This is the table that I, I wanted to get rid of. So I put it on free cycle. And someone said, hey, I'll, we'll come pick it up. So afterwards, I realized, hmm, did, they really, did I really need to tell them where my address was? So I looked at them because I used my phone to take a picture of it. Even though my GPS is off, the exit data on the thing uh, showed that this table was sitting in my front yard. So this is innocent ignorance. Even though my GPS was off, I didn't realize that my phone was still tagging the exact GPS location of, of, the tape of where I took the picture. I mean, think about that. We're consumers, so like we want to know everything. We watch these investigative reports, right? Big, I mean, we have a TV show called Big Brother, right? People watch this. You know, we want to know about people. We want to see people, you know, doing, th you know. We, yeah, I mean, think about all these things. We, we want this stuff, so because we want it, someone's going to go get it for us. This is a quote from Aristotle. Basically, says human beings exist because they want to, you know, associate with other people. Go on to uh, Bing. They have a thing called Map Apps. Twitter. This is today or the last couple days. Geo Geolocated tweets around the hotel. You can click on them and see who they are, what they're talking about. You guys use those exercise things that like tell you how you you know tweet put it on the internet where you're where you're driving your bike or you're you're jogging. This guy put his like um, his jog online, and it went onto Google Maps, and you could find out one place was listed as his home, one place was listed as his place of work. I mean, people put this stuff online. I'm not saying you can't. Um, so people who ride the metro here in DC, there's a thing called the Smart Trip card, records your uh, every time you go from one place to another. So this guy took all his Smart Trip data and mapped it. So this basically says these are the stations that he's coming and going to. So obviously Silver Spring is probably where he lives and goes all these other places. But this data that I mean it's not publicly available, but if you could get your hands on this data, you'll learn a lot about someone. Who's got an easy pass or some other sort of device that, uh, yeah. Who's got, a, who's got a customer, who's got a, a, a loyalty card with a business where like you give them the card? There's a firefighter in Tukwila, Washington who was arrested because uh, his Safeway club card showed that he bought this certain type of fire, fire starter that was used, uh, the same type, same type that was used to start a fire, so he was arrested for it. Turns out that someone else confessed to the crime and, and turns out that they didn't need a warrant to even get the data because he had willingly turned it over to, the, to Safeway. Who's got a Hilton Honors card? Yeah? 
Third party doctrine basically says that once you share your information with someone else, you give it to a company or business, you have no expectation of privacy in that information anymore. So the police don't even, typically don't even need a warrant for that information. Easy pass all over the East Coast, fast track, yeah. All your information, anything that's collected, typically. They just opened up a new road in Maryland, uh, ICC, Intercounty Connector. Anybody drive on it yet? Intercounty Connector is easy pass only, right? You have to have an easy pass, and if you don't, they take a picture of your car and they send you send you a ticket or send you a, a bill in the mail, and it's 150% of the of the of the fee. So they charge you more to not use easy pass. I mean, they're basically forcing you to do it. You don't have to, but they're forcing you to do it. Uh, GPS providers have sold data to the police, and then they use that data to set up traps. Anybody have one of these? Progressive snapshot or Allstate DriveWise. You put these th attached things into your car, and you can save 30% on your insurance when you give them this data, because they're going to find out you're not an aggressive driver. What are they recording? All sorts of things, accelerations, speeding, uh, GPS locations. They're recording everything you're doing, right? Do you, is, it, is it worth it? Acquiescence. Acquiescence is the most important one because this is where we know about something and we still don't care about it. So like the, the, scan, the naked scanner, there's the court said, so far have said, okay, it's constitutional. So we say, oh, okay, it's constitutional, I'll do it. Acquiescence, the way to fight it is to say just because it's constitutional doesn't mean we should fight against it. We saw Senator Rand Paul um, went through the machine uh, this past weekend and it, it hit on him and, he said, and they wanted to give him a pat down. And he's like, no, I'm not getting the pat down. And, they, and they eventually they escorted him out of the airport. And people were saying, oh, he needs to be treated like everyone else. Well, of course he was treated like everyone else. They didn't let him fly. They kicked him out. But he's making, he, it wasn't, the scene was not about him. He's making a stand. He's making a you know stand about what's going on. So uh, the Metro here in D.C. started random bag searches. I mean, random bag searches. You don't have to be a suspect. They're just going to search your bag. Anybody hear about Viper teams? So the DHS they have these things called Viper teams. They go around and they like random inspections. And now they're doing it on interstate highways. Random stops on highways. No suspicion. How much time do I have? Okay. How about all this? How about all this surveillance around? Um, a lot of a lot of uh, communities install these red light speed cameras. So you know, if you go through a red light, it takes your picture. Well, now they take pictures while you're sitting at the intersection, and if your car is six inches over the yellow, uh, over the white line, you know, in the box, they'll give you a ticket for that. Yeah, this is uh, this is actually a report that the ACLU of Illinois did on surveillance cameras in Chicago. It's really good. Okay, so the whole thing here is called reasonable expectation of privacy. Reasonable is probably the most litigated word in, in, in the English language. And the reason is reasonable by nature is a subjective term. There's two parts to this test. One is an actual objective uh, expectation of privacy. In other words, you, you, know, you go into a phone booth and you close the door and you hold your hand over the mouthpiece, you, you, you have an expectation of privacy. The second piece is very subjective, and that is that society says that your expectation of privacy is reasonable. So it's sort of a loop, but, you know, but both of these things are variables, right? We can change them. So you go into a phone booth, you close the door, you cover, you know, you, you're speaking with a very low voice. Not only do you have a reasonable expectation of privacy, but pe people will generally say, yes, you do. What about you walking around in a public park? Do you have a reasonable expectation of privacy? No, not really. What about in your home? Well, yeah, in your home you do. What about when you put your trash out on the curb? Well, once you take it to the curb, you, you're basically saying, I'm ready for someone to pick it up. It, you have no expectation of privacy. What about in a backpack? When something's in a container, generally you have a reasonable expectation of privacy in. What about these clear backpacks that they make kids use at school? Now you can see why there's a lot of litigation about the Fourth Amendment. What about social media? Sharing information, putting all this stuff out there. I'm not saying you shouldn't share information, but think about the consequences of it. 
So he, I, I don't code, but here's my reasonable expectation of privacy. Both variables have to be true, okay? That's basically what I'm saying here. Here's your key takeaways. If you have an expectation of privacy and society finds that expectation to be reasonable, um, then you actually have a reasonable expectation of privacy. The Fourth Amendment applies. Um, if either variable is false, once you put something out there, once you, put your, once you put your trash out to the curb, you're saying, I'm ready for someone to take it away, you've lost that expectation. Um, both variable, both are, they, are, they are variables, so we have to do something about it, right? How many people are flying out of here tomorrow or next day or somewhere?